In the early stages of the war, it was generally felt that Vietnam was an unsuitable theater for the employment of armored units. Their subsequent deployment dispelled this idea. The mobility of armored units made them extremely versatile, and in many cases their mobility became a crucial factor despite the otherwise overwhelming use of helicopters. The 1st U.S. Armored Unit, 3rd Platoon Company B, and 3rd Marine Tank Battalion arrived in March 1965. Vietnam saw the emergence of the M113 and its variants as the dominant armored vehicle. We, we started out uh, up in the, uh, in the highlands at Play Coup with the uh, 4th Infantry Division. We were actually the 3rd Brigade of the 25th Infantry, but they, when, they 20, when the 4th Infantry Division got over there, they cross-reinforced or cross-detached a brigade. But we were further detached, Alpha Company was further detached from the 4th Infantry Division down to the 1st Cav Division down on K. So we were sort of unique in that we were the only tank company supporting an entire division. The first major engagement involving U.S. armor was by Troop A, 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry, in the Battle of Op Bai Bong. On 11th February 1965, Troop A, 1st of the 4th Cav, Company A, 2nd of the 2nd Infantry, and Battery C, 2nd of the 33rd Artillery, repulsed a series of guerrilla attacks on a defensive position near the village of Op Bai Bong. The VC launched three assaults against the perimeter, but were met by a hail of fire from the M113s from the 1st ID's Cavalry Squadron and artillery resulting in 198 confirmed VC killed. Five APCs and mortar carriers were lost, but the unit suffered only light personnel casualties. This action demonstrated the potential effectiveness of mounted units and gained the attention of General Westmoreland, who subsequently requested the deployment of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, as well as the 25th Infantry Division. In March 1966, the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment was alerted for movement to the Republic of Vietnam. In preparation, the regiment modified its M113 personnel carriers through the addition of machine guns and gun shields. The result was the Armored Cavalry Assault Vehicle, ACAV, which reflected lessons learned from the South Vietnamese Army and American forces already in Vietnam. 11th ACR was initially tasked with securing the roads in provinces around Saigon, but were soon mounting operations off-road. In July 1968, Colonel George S. Patton, the son of the great World War II general, assumed command of the 11th. He routinely operated the regiment off-road in search of enemy concentrations. The 11th ACR conducted a series of search and destroy missions that cut Viet Cong supply routes between Saigon and the Cambodian border. In the course of these operations, Patton summed up his conduct of operations with the expression, find the bastards, then pile on. The role of armor in Vietnam was sort of a, it was a test as you go. It, it was initially felt that there was no role for armor over there except maybe for uh, one, one, M113 uh, personnel carriers. Tactics ranged from Patton's concept of pile on, where a small U.S. force would be used as bait. If the enemy took the bait, it soon would be massively reinforced by awaiting reserves, using armor as the hammer in rapid hammer and anvil maneuvers, wherein air mobile infantry were rapidly deployed to the rear of an enemy force. The armor would be used to herd the enemy into the kill zone from which few escaped. Using armor in this fashion enabled the U.S. to attack into the heartland of NVA and VC sanctuaries, whether they are in the dense jungles bordering Cambodia and Laos, the flooded paddies of the Mekong Delta, or the relatively wide open spaces of the Iron Triangle. In the early years of Vietnam, the night had always belonged to Charlie, but armor could even take the night from the enemy. Nighttime thunder runs became a common occurrence. A thunder run was when an armored column would quite literally thunder along a road firing all available weaponry into the adjacent terrain with the goal of either spoiling NBA VC activities or to preempt ambushes and mine laying.
On 31 May 1967, then Staff Sergeant Charles Hayslip was serving as a platoon sergeant with Company A, 1st Battalion, 69th Armor, 4th Infantry Division in a cordon and search mission at An Kui. They thought they lost contact with, uh, with the NVA and they told us to take a uh, platoon of uh, infantry with us and sweep through this one village, it's called An Kui 1, and go up north of that and uh, secure a pickup zone for the rest of the company. Upon entering the village, Sergeant Hayslip's unit came under heavy attack from a well-entrenched North Vietnamese battalion. So we crossed this one little stream, had a small bridge where just one tank could go across. And, and as soon as you cross into it, there was an open area and there was a, like an L-shaped area. As soon as we got across, uh, there was a battalion of NVA that was in these bunkers in this village and one of them intermittently or, or inadvertently far to burst a machine gun fire. During the decisive first minutes of the battle, he exposed himself to the withering fire to direct the fire of his tanks on the enemy positions. I had about 10 or 12 infantrymen got shot off the back, of the back deck of my tank. And when you get into, a, into a, an ambush situation like that, some of the, it's characterized by either uh, loss of communications, loss of cohesion, and seemingly like a lot, you know, like chaos and what have you. And what you've got to do is, uh, in, a, in a meeting type or an ambush situation like that is to get, is to regain control. And you do this by uh, getting far superiority. And you can best get far superiority by laying down a heavy volume of fire. And this is when your loader starts loading that canister round and HE and start firing at point blank just as fast as he can load that main gun. And a good loader can, fire, can put a round in that chamber about every three or four seconds. And you start firing it in patterns, and then you start laying that track down one block at a time and moving forward. What makes a tank effective is that it's through its armor-protected fire, uh, firepower uh, and its mobility. And the two of these combine to create shock, uh, combine the, to create the shock effect that you want to get because anybody out to the front, he's either going to get down or he's going to get dead. When the platoon leader's radio and tank was damaged, Sergeant Hazlip took command of the entire platoon and laid down a heavy barrage of fire to enable the infantrymen to evacuate their wounded. Now, the platoon leader's uh, tank was damaged uh, during the, at, at the outset. Uh, he, he dismounted his tank and fought with the infantry. And, uh, I, uh, I took over the, the platoon. He positioned the combined team for an assault and destroyed many enemy bunkers with his tank and grenades. His dauntless courage and quick reactions in the early fighting prevented the enemy from seizing control of the situation. Staff Sergeant Hazlip's extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty were in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. What I did was nothing more than what uh, everyone else was doing. I just happened to have gotten re recognized for it, that's all. Staff Sergeant Charles Hazlip received the Distinguished Service Cross for his extraordinary heroism in Vietnam. Mobility and flexibility were the keys to armored success during the Tet Offensive. At Saigon, Tansanut Air Base, Benoit, and Long Ben, armor was instrumental in repulsing BC attacks. During the initial hours of the Tet Offensive, mounted units were able to react quickly and move to threatened areas. In many instances, they provided just-in-time firepower and support. Over the following days, the situation in many urban areas began to stabilize. American and South Vietnamese forces reorganized and undertook counterattacks. These actions were aimed at destroying the Viet Cong and removing them from urban enclaves. 
In bloody close quarter street fights, the armored units used firepower to eliminate resistance. We had the M40A3 tank, which, uh, which was an excellent uh, piece of equipment. What made the M40A3 most effective was the variety of uh, tank gun ammunition. Besides having the HEP and the heat that the M M60 series had, it also had the HE round and it had a canister round and later on it got a beehive. The most effective round for enemy uh, personnel that we found was the canister round. That's nothing more than a big 9 millimeter shotgun shell on steroids. You got about 1180 cylindrical pellets that would be coming out of that uh, gun tube about on a 30 degree tangent from the center line at about 2800 feet per second and there's uh, each one of those pellets about the size of half the size of a cigarette filter and uh, just looking for something to hit. And it was very effective and devastating against enemy personnel. Through aggressive movement, they helped infantry to maneuver in the streets and regain captured buildings. Spearheading attacks, armored vehicles tended to become fire magnets, sometimes to the disgruntlement of nearby infantry. However, by drawing fire, they made possible significant advances by infantry and were able to provide effective fire support. Following Tet, with the VC practically eliminated as a cohesive fighting force, U.S. armor swiftly regained the initiative. U.S. armor strength peaked in 1968, and in early 1969, the only engagement between U.S. armor and communist armor took place at the Special Forces Camp of Ben Het. This particular camp was strategically placed overlooking the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and thus presented a prime target for the NBA and VC. Tanks from 1st Battalion 69th Armor had been stationed at the camp since early in the year. On March 3rd, 1969, the enemy attacked with PT-76 tanks and APCs. U.S. M48A3s engaged the enemy armored forces using heat ammunition and destroyed two PT-76s and an APC. Remaining operations in 1969 were mostly concerned with disrupting enemy logistical bases within Vietnam in operations such as Montana Raider. These operations helped to clear the bulk of the enemy within the country, and having completed that task, the armored units were switched to border security. Throughout the Vietnam War, communist forces used neutral Cambodia as a staging area for guerrillas. On 1 May 1970, the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, in conjunction with Arvin troops, attacked across the Cambodian border near a landmark nicknamed the Fishhook. Its goal was to link up with 1st Cav Air Mobile, which had been airlifted in as a blocking force. Total losses for the entire operation included 20,000 guerrillas and North Vietnamese regulars, testimony to the surprise achieved by American and South Vietnamese forces. The attack into Cambodia denied the enemy access to his safe havens, interrupted the supply flow along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and destroyed multiple supply dumps. However successful, the Cambodian operations marked the last large-scale employment of U.S. armored forces in the Vietnam War. The pause in enemy activity facilitated the transition of responsibility from American to South Vietnamese forces. The last U.S. ground cavalry unit to conduct operations was Troop F, 17th Cavalry, which departed RVN in April 1971.